I'd like to talk today about a scholar who wrote the first astrology textbook in England over 800 years ago. Although this might not seem very relevant if you live outside England, don't switch off just yet. Astrology in medieval England was a microcosm of what was going on all over Europe. So what I'm going to talk about has a direct relevance to you if you're a contemporary astrologer practicing anywhere in Europe, Western Asia, North or South America, Australia, New Zealand or Africa, because what we loosely call Western astrology has this medieval astrology as its ancestor. Now, you'll notice that I didn't mention India or China, which might seem like a major oversight, as these are the two most populous countries in the world, and they comprise over a third of the world's population. And indeed, the vast majority of astrologers in the world today are Indian, because astrology is mainstream in India, unlike the West. I left them off my list because both these countries have their own long history of astrology with a different ancestry. Medieval um, astrology owes a big debt to Indian astrology, though, and it does incorporate some of its techniques. Now, the chances are that if you're watching this video, you're a Western astrologer. And the very fact that you're able to draw up charts today is as a result of some extraordinary changes that took place in the 12th century. So let's start with a very condensed history of astrology. Now, you've probably heard of Hellenistic astrology developed in Greece about 2000 years ago. But Hellenistic is a confusing term. Greece was part of the Roman Empire, and a map of the Roman Empire at its height in the second century is shown here. Roman society was heavily influenced by Greece, and Roman scholars were bilingual, knowing both Latin and Greek, and so Hellenistic astrology could equally well be called Roman astrology. It was in use across the Roman Empire, including in Roman Britain. Hadrian, after whom Hadrian's Wall is named, used to cast his own horoscope annually. So astrology was mainstream and the techniques of drawing up fairly accurate astrology charts were known and used. And by the fourth century, the newly Christian Roman Empire had become too big to rule as a single entity. It split into a Western and Eastern half. Um, and in fact, not long after the split is when it adopted Christianity as the state religion. And the new power base was definitely in the East in Constantinople, where the day-to-day -day language was Greek. The Western Empire was subject to numerous invasions by Germanic tribes. They were also mostly Christian and they could speak and understand Latin, but not Greek. And the Western Roman Empire eventually succumbed to these Germanic tribes. So this meant that the knowledge of Greek, which is the language that most of the astrological texts were written in, gradually got lost in the West, where the focus was now on the Christian church and Latin. And that meant that knowledge of how to do practical astrology was lost. And on top of that, Christianity was suspicious of astrology because of its pagan roots. Greek was still the day-to-day -day language in the Eastern Empire, and so scholars there did still have access to astrological texts. And in 576, the Emperor Justinian, based in the East, issued an edict to stamp out heresy. It wasn't specifically aimed at astrology, but a lot of the scholars who were studying astrology fled East to the Persian Empire, whose religion of Zoroastrianism was far more welcoming towards astrology. And these scholars took their Greek texts with them, and they worked with Persian scholars who translated them. And those Persian astrologers uh, were also familiar with Indian astrology, and they had an astrology of their own based on Zoroastrian beliefs of millennial cycles. So Hellenistic astrology was stirred into a melting pot that included Indian and Persian astrology, but it migrated to Persia and it fell into decline in the Christian world. And shortly after that, the new religion of Islam arose in Arabia and conquered the mighty Persian Empire. Although Islam, like Christianity, is a monotheistic religion and suspicious of pagan ideas, it embraced the Persian and Roman sciences, including astrology, studied their texts and translated them into Arabic. Thus, by the 8th century, Baghdad had become a major center of learning and scholars from across the Muslim world flocked there. Islam spread rapidly and by the 8th century, had also taken over half of Spain. So this Roman or Hellenistic astrology found its way into Islamic Spain in places of learning like Toledo, near modern day Madrid. Now, while astrology was being enthusiastically translated and practiced in the Islamic world, it was still treated with suspicion by the church in the Christian West. Church authorities from St. Augustine in the fourth century to the Venerable Bede in the eighth condemned it as being blasphemous. But they couldn't ban the investigation of planetary cycles completely because there was one area that was vitally important to the Christian church, the ability to be able to calculate the days of Easter in advance. Now, the Gospels state that Christ was crucified on the eve of Passover, 
Passover is a Jewish festival celebrated on the first full moon of spring. And the church therefore decreed that Easter, representing Christ's resurrection, should be celebrated on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox. Now, calculating full moons involves understanding how lunar and solar cycles interact, and it's not trivial. This meant that Christian monks in, uh, monks in Europe had to study astronomy and mathematics. Now, this beautifully illustrated manuscript from the 13th century shows one text on computers, but it was a hot topic in Christianity um, from the fourth century onwards. Bede, who I mentioned earlier, and I said that he considered astrology to be blasphemous, promoted computus, that's the um, art of working out the date of Easter. Uh, and ironically, the fact that Christian scholars had to study planetary cycles opened the door to that most blasphemous of subjects, astrology. Now, in fact, the church was rather ambivalent on the topic. French scholar Gerbert Doriac, shown in this statue, was a keen scholar of science and astrology, and he had contacts with the Islamic world. He introduced an astronomical instrument called an astrolabe into Christian Europe, and he got hold of some Arabic astrological texts too. Was he committing blasphemy? Well, perhaps, but rather ironically, he became Pope in the year 999. So we have a Pope to thank for introducing hardcore astrology into Christian Europe. Now I say hardcore because despite the Christian hostility towards astrology, folk astrology still existed. Everybody knew about zodiac signs and imagery, moon phases, and so on, but the complicated techniques and calculations to do horoscopic astrology and draw up charts had been long lost. And that's why the church didn't bother too much about astrology, because without the ability to draw up charts, nobody could do real astrology. And from the church's point of view, there were bigger heretical fish to fry. Now, all this changed in 1085, however, Toledo, a major center of learning in Islamic Spain, fell to the Christians. This was shortly before the First Crusade, and relations between Christians and Muslims weren't particularly good, but the new Christian ruler of Spain rather unusually encouraged the, encouraged the Muslim and Jewish scholars of Toledo to remain, and Christian scholars then flocked to Toledo to learn Arabic and translate Arabic texts. And a lot of these texts were on astrology, and they included that essential key, texts on how to calculate planetary positions. Now, I can't stress too much just how important this breakthrough uh, was. Here's a text, uh, newly available in the 11th century from the Arabic world and translated into Latin. This photo is an original copy that's in Paris from the 11th century. A highlighted line reads, Mercury in the third house will make priests, magicians, healers, astrologers. So this is a genuine astrology how-to manual. Any budding astrologer reading this will be desperate to find out what house their Mercury is in. But if you can't calculate planetary positions, you have no hope of finding out. If you don't know where your natal Mercury is, you don't know what house it's in. And a breakthrough came with the translation of planetary tables. And this is where England comes into our story. The prior of Malvern, a man called Walcher, translated planetary tables from the 9th century Muslim scholar Muhammad ibn Musa, uh, ibn Musa al Khwarizmi in the early 12th century. Now, this scholar, al Khwarizmi, was quite the polymath. He wrote a book on mathematics called the Book of Combination, or in Arabic, Kitab al Jabr. And that's where we get the word algebra from. And his name, which simply means Muhammad, son of Musa from Khwarazam, got mangled in Latin translation from al Khwarizmi to algorithmus. And that's where we get the word algorithm from. He also wrote a set of planetary tables translated from the Arabic by Walcher with the help of a Jewish convert called Petrus Alfonsi. And another scholar a decade or so later called Adelard of Bath also seems to have been part of a circle of scholars. And he taught astrology to the future King Henry II of England while Henry was a prince living in Bristol. Adelard had traveled to Syria and learned Arabic and he provided a better translation of these tables. And this manuscript from Spain shows a copy of Adelard's translation. And I should point out the planetary tables of the 12th century weren't like modern ephemerides. Your American ephemeris for the 21st century contains half a million printed values in it, and it would have been impossible to hand write all of those and distribute them. So these early tables just contained figures that needed a lot of painstaking arithmetic to draw up actual planetary positions. But that's what you had to do, that's what you had to learn if you wanted to find out whether you have Mercury in the third house. Another scholar called Roger, the hero of our story in fact, 
was also part of this circle of scholars with an interest in Arabic science. He was a teacher at the Cathedral School in Hereford on the English-Welsh border, and he was part of the bishop's household. Now, remember what I said about Christianity being suspicious of astrology. Well, it doesn't seem that way now. We have bishops, a king, a prince, a prior of the church, all embracing astrology in the 1170s. But for those of you familiar with English geography, you might have noticed a pattern. All of these places are in the west of England, and Hereford in particular had long had a reputation for being a centre of learning for Arabic sciences. And in the late 11th century, the Bishop of Hereford was a man called Gerard. He was a keen patron of learning, and it was his habit to read Firmicus Maternus's Mathesis. That's the book that told you that Mercury in the third house made you a good astrologer, although he wouldn't have been able to calculate charts at that point. And in 1100, he was promoted to Archbishop of York. Now, reading astrology books was considered perfectly normal in Hereford, but the monks at York were horrified when they discovered Gerard was doing this, and they were convinced that he was a practitioner of the dark arts. And a few years later, he died peacefully in the garden at York, and they refused to bury him in hallowed ground. So the west of England then seemed to be a haven for astrology and promoted by the church authorities there, but this wasn't the universally the case. In York, it was still taboo. And in a way, that's understandable. The 12th century was in the middle of the Crusades, Spain was contested territory between Christians and Muslims, and astrology had always been condemned by the church for being heretical and blasphemous. And yet, in the West Country, we have a teacher at the Cathedral School in the 1170s teaching kids astrology, and not any old astrology, but astrology from the Islamic world. And this wasn't just a maverick teacher. The Bishop of Hereford, like Gerard before him, was quite happy for astrology to be promoted. So we can imagine what a hypothetical tabloid newspaper of the 12th century might have to say about these strange goings on at Hereford with balmy bishops indoctrinating kids with Islamic astrology and condemning their souls to hell. We can imagine the outrage. The Daily Whale can exclusively reveal that a renegade teacher at Hereford Cathedral School has been teaching children Islamic astrology. We presented this damning evidence to the Bishop of Hereford, Robert Folio, demanding to know what action he would take. He simply smiled and said, oh yes, I've been encouraging Roger to teach the boys about Arabic astrology. Fascinating stuff. So who was Roger of Hereford? What was this cathedral school all about? And what was he teaching his students? Well, this photo shows a picture of Hereford Cathedral School today. It's still going as a school, although this isn't the original building. And cathedrals in the 12th century sometimes had schools attached to them. Some were song schools, teaching kids to sing hymns and learn Latin prayers by rote. But they didn't need to understand what the words meant, but it was also necessary to have schools to teach more complex skills, such as Latin grammar, computers and mathematics for the clergy and people that were going to go into the clergy. And they were called grammar schools and the teachers there were often lay people rather than clergy. And these cathedrals were called secular cathedrals and Hereford was one of these. Now, these cathedral schools were the forerunners of universities. And Hereford was a particularly major one. Roger was teaching in the late 1170s, which is a few decades before Oxford University became a major centre of learning. And we know from records that students started university at 14 and they did a seven year course. So they were a lot younger than undergraduates of today and they were taught in Latin. And the first few years were spent on the basics, learning the three paths of logic, grammar and rhetoric. And these three paths are called the tree via in Latin. It's where we get the word trivial from. And this was followed by the four paths, the quadrivium of mathematics, music, geometry, and astrology. And this is what was being taught at Hereford to the kids there. They would all have been boys, uh, mostly from wealthy families, already well-grounded in Latin, and they would probably have been early to mid-teens. And in the 1170s, this new learning really took off. Nobody knew how to calculate charts in the 11th century in Christian Europe, but armed with numerous new texts, freshly translated from Arabic into Latin, there was now a vast array of Arabic astrological learning available. And these texts allowed you to do real astrology, cast charts, delineate natal charts, and do horary astrology. So if there was a huge translation movement in the 12th century, what was so special about Roger of Hereford? Well, the answer is that he was a teacher, not a translator. By 1176, there were huge numbers of Arabic astrological texts translated, and many of them read like reference works for people already familiar with the subject. 
Roger realized that this was overwhelming for the students, so he wrote a textbook for them. And this is the introduction from a later 14th century copy. Unfortunately, we haven't got Roger's original 12th century manuscript. And this paragraph says that he's gathering together diverse scattered texts into a single volume. And later on, he says this is the first time anyone has done this. In other words, he's written England's first astrology textbook. Now, he wrote this in the 1170s, long before the printing press, so it was handwritten. Now, although he was teaching at an English school, like all scholarly texts of the time, it was written in Latin. There are 22 copies of this manuscript still in existence. We haven't found Roger's original handwritten one yet. So this, uh, the earliest one is from about 40 years after Roger was writing. And the manuscripts are spread all over Europe and they date from the 13th century to the 16th. So it was copied far and wide. And books didn't generally have titles in those days either. So we, they're usually identified in library catalogues with rambling Latin opening lines. And that causes confusion. And what I did as part of my PhD was locate all 22 manuscripts, compile them into a single version and translate it into plain English. I also thought it made sense to give it a snappier title than, for example, Liber de Tribus Generalibus Judicius Astronomiae Quibus Seketera Omnia de Fluent, which was favoured by Cambridge University's library catalogue. So I just called it Judicial Astrology, a much snappier title. And it's a horary textbook, Horary astrology is where you cast a chart for the time a question is asked. For instance, will my journey be successful or where is my missing son? And it's a delight to read Roger's book. Most Arabic texts on horary astrology are broken down by house with lots and lots of headings with different possible questions. Roger's approach is actually much like a modern day teacher's. He starts off with a simple rule, a general rule, shows how it can be applied and then moves on to harder examples. But what's likely to be of interest to astrologers today isn't Roger's horary techniques, which are fairly standard and known to any horary astrologer today, but his book of intentions, which contains a number of techniques that are very rarely used today. And we've kind of rediscovered them from Roger's texts. The idea is that when someone visits an astrologer to ask a horary astrology, uh, a horary question, the astrologer needs to know the intention behind the question. Now, at first glance, this might seem a bit odd, because if somebody comes to see you and asks you a question, they presumably know why they've come to see you, but the astrologer needs to dig a bit deeper. In some ways, this can be seen as the forerunner of a sort of psychological astrology. You know, what's really going on in the client's mind? Uh, for example, let's suppose that someone comes to see you as an astrologer and asks, will my father recover from his illness? Now, on the face of it, this seems like a very reasonable question about illness. And in horary astrology, that's a sixth house matter. The astrologer would note uh, that the question is about the client's father and the father's illness. So using the standard rules of horary astrology, the father would be the fourth house. So the astrologer would look at the ruler of the fourth house as the planet representing the father. Illnesses are sixth house matters, but it's the father's illness. So the astrologer would look at the sixth house from the fourth, that's the ninth house, and look at the planet ruling that house to represent the illness. And then the astrologer would look at the relationship between those two planets and analyze them. Is the illness stronger than the father or vice versa? If the illness is stronger, it'll probably kill him. If the father is stronger than the illness, he'll probably recover. Now, this is all standard stuff. But what's the client's intention behind asking the question? It could be that the client doesn't really want dad to get better, but is actually wondering when they'll get their head, hands on dad's inheritance. Now it's suddenly become an eighth house question. Now, some modern astrologers will do something comparable. They'll, say, cast a consultation chart set for the time of the appointment when the client's going to come to visit them to have a birth chart reading. Now, that's fine because that consultation chart will be very different from the uh, client's birth chart. But in the case of medieval horary astrologers, where there wasn't necessarily any forewarning of a client's visit, the consultation chart time would be exactly the same time that the question was asked. So the charts would be identical. So for this reason, Roger needed a different set of techniques to examine the intention. And many of these are really quite obscure and rarely used these days, but they're all in Roger's book. Now, from the manuscripts he left behind, we know a fair amount about his teaching style and his astrology. But what of Roger's legacy? And what of Roger, the man himself? He taught at an influential school known for its specialization in Arabic science. And these topics were suddenly taught they were subsequently taught at Oxford University. 
Were any of the Oxford tutors former students of Roger? Did they use Roger's textbooks with their own students? We don't know. Nobody subsequently mentioned Roger of Hereford in a teaching context, although later writers do dedicate non-astrological works to him, and his manuscripts were copied for centuries. And what about Roger himself? When was he born? When did he die? Did he marry? Did he have children? Did he travel to Islamic Spain and learn Arabic? We don't know. Um, when I submitted my PhD thesis in 2019, I added this paragraph. Roger of Hereford is a shadowy character about whom few details are known with any certainty. However, contemporary scholars do have access to manuscripts that he wrote. And so although it's difficult to find out much about Roger of Hereford the person, his ideas can be analyzed and discussed as though that was the end of the matter. Now, just as I was about to submit my thesis, I received a rather surprising email on my university account from an American professor who claimed to be a descendant of Roger of Hereford. He sent me a photocopy from a Victorian edition of Burke's Landed Gentry, which referred to an aristocratic family in Hereford who claimed descent from the famous philosopher uh, Roger of Hereford. It's an interesting piece of oral family history, but it's very speculative. But if it is true, it means we've got a family tree for Roger that leads right down to the present day. And this claim was taken seriously by Roger French, who was a 20th century scholar who wrote that Roger of Hereford lived in Mordiford, near Hereford, and that the family still lived there. <clears throat> and there was an obituary for Robert Hereford, who died at the age of 91 in 2001, who says that the family have been there since Norman times. And Robert's son, Major James Hereford, had at least two children, Mark Hereford, who's the current heir to the Hereford estate at Mordiford, and his brother Henry, who's an actor who appeared in The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. I couldn't include any of this in my thesis because it was too speculative and I couldn't track down the family. However, in August 2022, something rather remarkable happened. A bit more digging revealed that Roger's land in Mordeford, are where the stately home of Sufton Court now stands, and I was able to get in touch with the current owner. So allow me to introduce 83-year-old Major James Hereford, who is the great 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 grandson of Roger of Hereford, who kindly posed to me after giving me a wonderful guided tour of the house, and he still lives on the same lands owned by Roger. He has two sons, Mark and Henry, I mentioned Henry just now, and Henry has a daughter, Mia, who was born last year. So Roger's line continues to this day, 850 years after Roger of Hereford wrote his book of intentions.